Okay, um, the second lesson in, in section E, which is on solids, liquids and gases, uh, encompasses the basic properties of different states of matter, Brownian motion, Boyle's law, absolute zero, and pressure law. Um, now if we look at this, we could start with the basic properties of matter. So if you think about particles in a solid. So the particles in a solid would appear like this. Now the particles are very, very cold and they vibrate in about a fixed position. Now if we increase the temperature, we can see that the particles gain more energy, they are vibrating more rapidly, however they are still stuck and fixed in this position. They occupy a fixed shape, a fixed volume. However, if we increase the temperature, what we'll notice is that the particles start to move over one another. And now they will occupy the shape of the bottom of the container. This is a liquid. Now, the particles are still touching, so therefore they can't be compressed. But now they can flow. So this would be the particles in a liquid. Ideally, there'd be more to show that it occupies the bottom of the container, but the particles are still very close together and therefore still cannot be compressed. If we raise the temperature further, then what happens is the particles gain sufficient energy to overcome the bonds that hold them together. So this here would now be a gas. Now we can see the particles in the gas are very far, far apart and occupy, occupy the full volume of their container. If we were to remove the energy and cool it down, then they would have less kinetic energy and therefore they would form those bonds again. So if this was the case of, say, steam, if we cool it down dramatically, it would then form ice. Okay? Now, as we go from one state to another, we go from a solid to a liquid because we melt it. Then we go um, from a liquid to a gas because we boil it. And then we go backwards the other way. So we go from um, a gas to a liquid, which is condensing, and then a liquid to a solid, which is freezing. Okay? Now, other things that we need to explore are the idea of Brownian motion. Now, Brownian motion was an experiment which showed this random kinetic energy of particles. It demonstrated that gas, for example, existed as particles and that they were constantly moving in this random haphazard motion because people were able to observe pollen grains or smoke particles and they saw that if we look at this purple ball here, the ball, which represents a pollen grain or a smoke particle, it vibrates in a random haphazard position. So its motion is jerky and it moves around. And by being able to see this without being able to see particles, they were able to deduce that the particles which, which were colliding with the pollen grain we're doing so in this random way and scientists were able to determine that this is how particles must be moving in order to create this random motion of the smoke particle or the pollen grain. So this showed us what must be happening, what must be colliding with it in order to create that motion. So the atoms which couldn't be seen, their motion was determined by looking at something which could be seen under a microscope. Now then, moving on from Brownian motion, we'll look at Boyle's law. Now Boyle's law is very important. So Boyle's law, when gases were observed and we looked at pressure against volume, it was found that if you take a gas and you squeeze it so the volume goes down, then the pressure will go up. And if you expand it and allow, allow the gas to expand into a greater volume, the pressure will go down. And from this, Boyle was able to determine an equation. And that is that P1V1 equals P2V2. And all this means is, if you looked at the pressure times the volume at a given point, when you expand the gas or compress the gas further, then the pressure times the volume at another point will be exactly the same. So, simple examples. Um, if you took a gas canister 
So a gas canister which expands to fill um, a room. Now if we think about it, the gas canister's volume is very small. So let's say we've got a gas canister. Now our gas canister's volume is 0.1 meters cubed. It's just a tenth of a meter cubed. And the pressure inside it, pressure inside it, we could say, is say 10 million pascals. When it's released and the gas is at the CO2 gas, whatever gas it is, is released and it's allowed to occupy the room. If we say that the pressure of the room, P2, is 100,000 pascals, we could then calculate what is the volume of CO2 in the room, okay? So if we allow pressurized CO2, a pressurized gas of 10 million pascals containing a volume of just 0.1 meters cubed, if we let it escape into the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, where the pressure is 100,000 pascals, what will be the volume of gas, okay? Or if we allowed it to inflate a giant balloon or something like this, what would be the volume of that balloon at atmospheric pressure? So very simply, we would just say P1, V1 is P2, V2, and we're trying to find V2. So if we're trying to find V2, we could rearrange the equation and say P1, V1 divided by P2 equal V2. So that would be 1 with 7 noughts times 0.1 divided by 1 with 5 noughts and this means we've actually got 1 times 10 to the 6 divided by 1 times 10 to the 5 and that would equal 10 meters cubed. So when this gas was allowed to expand, it would expand to occupy a volume of 10 meters cubed, which does make sense given that the pressure here is a hundred times, so a hundred times that is um, 10 meters cubed, okay? Now, other experiments were done, which you need to be aware of, which highlight absolute zero. So if you think about absolute zero, So scientists plotted graphs of temperature of temperature in degrees C. Temperature in degrees C against pressure. And what they found was they obtained nice straight lines which looked like this. Now then scientists realised, well, if we extrapolate this, this clearly was zero degrees C, but the pressure isn't zero. If we extrapolate it, what will happen? So if we continue this line in a straight line, there is a point when the pressure exerted by the gas becomes zero. And at that pressure, that must be the coldest temperature which can exist. It's the temperature at which the particles no longer vibrate and therefore they no longer exert pressure. And this temperature was found to be roughly minus 273 degrees C. And this is now called naught zero Kelvin. Okay? So this is the Kelvin scale. Now it's very important that we remember this Kelvin scale because when we look at pressure law calculations, we always need to make sure that temperature is in Kelvin. It must be in Kelvin. So for example, if you, were, if you were given a temperature of say 20 degrees C and you were doing a calculation, you must convert this into Kelvin because degrees C, it's kind of arbitrary. We need to start at zero Kelvin minus 273 degrees C for all our calculations, okay? So if we were to convert 20 degrees C into Kelvin, we'd remember to add 273, so it would be 293 Kelvin. 
So, using this relationship, it was determined that P1 over T1 is P2 over T2. So what this is saying is, if we have a gas contained in a container at a given temperature, then if that temperature is increased, we have pressure and temperature, remember? If the temperature is increased, then the pressure will increase because the particles now have more kinetic energy, therefore they're colliding more with the, um, with the inside of the container, and therefore they're increasing, in, uh, creating a greater pressure on the inside of the container. So mathematically, we can create this relationship, P1 over T1 is P2 over T2. So if we were given a problem, this is to highlight where it's essential that we can convert to Kelvin. So for example, we could say gas is contained in a box and the, the gas is air pressure and it's 20 degrees C. So we could say air at 20 degrees C, it's contained in a, in a canister or, or a meter cube, something like that, is atmospheric pressure which is 100,000 pascals. So calculate the pressure when the temperature increases to, say, 90 degrees C. So for example, if we had car tyres, I know car tyres are at high pressure, but we have a car, a car tyre or anything containing air or gas, at atmospheric pressure, 20 degrees C, what's going to happen if the temperature goes up? So all we would do is we can, re we can put the numbers in and then rearrange the equation or rearrange it first. So we would say, we are after, we have P1, we have T1, we have T2, so we're trying to find P2. Now the most important thing here, I think, in this question is to remember to convert these temperatures. So the first thing we need to do is say, what is temperature 1? So temperature 1 is 20 plus 273, which is 293 Kelvin. And T2, we remember 273 plus 90 is 363 Kelvin. So the temperature's gone up by 70 degrees or 70 Kelvin. Okay. So if I rearrange this equation, I could say P2 equals P1 T2 divided by T1. So I've just taken this up here. And that equals pressure 1, 100,000. Oops. times 293 divided by temperature 1 which is oh my apologies written on 1 100,000 times T2 which is 363 divided by 293 and this will give us pressure 2 now that equals This equals 124,000 pascals. Now, when we look at this, we say to ourselves, is it realistic? And of course it is realistic, because it's gone from 100,000 to 124,000 pascals. And then you might say, well, hang on. It's gone from 20 degrees C to 90 degrees C. And some people would say, that's gone up four and a half times. So we would expect a four and a half times increase in pressure to be 450,000. Why is that not the case? And of course, it's because 20 degrees C is not relative to absolute zero. We need to take it to absolute zero and say it's actually gone from 293 to 363, so we can see it hasn't gone up four and a half times at all. Okay? And that relationship is why we've got it just going up by about 25%. Uh, okay?